In this presentation, we are going to look at chapter 6 through 14 in the book of Revelation. What some of the symbols are, what some possible meanings are, and what it teaches us in the latter days to help us prepare for Christ and his coming. So let's begin with Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, the first six seals. As each of the seven seals of the book was opened, John saw visions concerning a thousand-year period of earth's history. CDNC 77.7 Thus the first seal related to the first thousand years of earth's tempor revealed temporal history from about 4,000 to 3,000 B.C. and so forth. The following chart identifies the first 6,000 year period and offers possible interpretations of the symbols John used to describe his vision. So now here are the charts, and I'll read from them um, what these charts identify about the first 6,000 years. For those who are listening to this in audio-only format, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can see these charts if you if that will help you. First seal, verse 2 of chapter 6, about 4,000 to 3,000 B.C. It talks about a white horse, which equals victory, a bow, which is symbolic of warfare, and a crown, which is symbolic of conquer, those in power. Commenting on Revelation 6, 1 through 2, Elder Bruce A. McConkie said, The most transcendent happenings we true to in these verses involved Enoch and his ministry, and it is interesting to note that what John saw was not the establishment of Zion and its removal to heavenly spheres, but the unparalleled wars in which Enoch, as a general over the armies of the saints, went forth conquering and to conquer. The second seal, verses 3 through 4, about 3,000 to 2,000 B.C. John sees a red horse, which is symbolic of bloodshed, and a sword, which is symbolic of war and destruction. As recorded in the scriptures, widespread wickedness and violence characterized this time period, which included the great flood during the days of Noah. The rider of the red horse had power to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. Who rode the red horse and the red horse of war and bloodshed and a sword and the second seal? Perhaps it was the devil himself, for surely he was the, that was the great day of his power, a day of such gross wickedness that every living soul save eight only was found worthy of death death by drowning. Or if it was not Lucifer, perhaps it was a man of blood or a person representing many murdering warriors of whom we have no record. Suffice it to say that the era from 3000 to 2000 BC was one of war and destruction. The third seal, verses 5 through 6, about 2000 to 1000 BC. John sees a black horse, which would equal or symbolic of famine. And then he saw balances, which would be symbolic of high prices for food. A measure of wheat would feed an adult for a day and cost a penny under these famine conditions. Penny is translated from the Greek word denarion, I hope I'm saying that right, which referred to a Roman coin that some estimate was worth the typical daily wage of a laborer. A person could purchase only enough food to live on with a whole day's wages, indicating extreme famine prices. In contrast, barley was less expensive and was thus eaten by the poor. As recorded in the scriptures, famines are characteristic of this time period. The fourth seal, verses 7 through 8, are about 1000 B.C. to the birth of Christ. John sees a pale horse, which would be symbolic of death. Then it talks about death and hell, which is the destruction of the wicked and their reception in the spirit prison. As recorded in the scriptures, great warring empires characterized this area, this era. Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
having rejected the warnings of prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah often found themselves victims of these conquering empires. Israel and Judah also fought against one another. The fifth seal, verses 9 through 11, are about the time of the birth of Christ to A.D. 1000. John sees an altar, which is symbolic of sacrifice, and then he saw souls, which were martyrs, Christians killed for their beliefs. Many early Christians, including nearly all of the original apostles, gave their lives as martyrs. John saw the Christian martyrs under the altar, suggesting that their lives were given in sacrifice to God's service, much like the sacrificial animals offered upon the altar of the temple. Because they gave up their lives for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, they were given white robes, symbolic of purity. The sixth seal, verses 12 through 17, is a time period of about A.D. 1000 to 2000. This thousand-year period will continue until just before Jesus Christ returns in glory and reigns personally on the earth. John noted seven signs that will accompany this time period. An earthquake, the darkened sun, the moon becoming as blood, stars falling, the heavens opening as a scroll, mountains and islands moving out of their places, and men seeking to hide themselves. Similar signs of the times are recorded elsewhere in Scripture. You can see Joel and Haggai in Doctrine and Covenants 29. Seven groups of men are also identified in these verses. Kings, great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, bondmen, and free men. The number of seven suggests completeness or wholeness. No enemies of God will escape his wrath in the last days. Chapter 6, verse 12. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard causing such an earthquake as never before been known. And it shall appear to man on earth as though the stars in the side real heavens are falling. In addition, as here recorded, some heavenly meteors or other objects appearing as stars will fall unto the earth. Indeed, the events of that day shall be so unprecedented and so beyond human experience that the prophets are and have been at an almost total loss for words to describe those realities pressed in upon them by the spirit of revelation. And we can envision only in small measure the great events which they saw and understood by the power of the spirit. That is, we are so limited unless we until we enjoy the same spirit and see the same things which that God, who is no respecter of persons, revealed to them. This phrase, this much, however, we do know. Towards the end of the sixth seal, the everlasting gospel has been restored and is now being preached to the nations of the earth. Soon that universal war and desolation destined to usher in and accompany the second coming itself shall commence. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That is Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, 33 through 36, or Matthew 24, 29. Verse 16, the phrase, the wrath of the Lamb, and verse 17, the phrase, the great day of the Lord, of his, the great day of his wrath is come. Precedent to our Lord's return, wars and desolations beyond our present ability to envision shall sweep the earth. What could be more descriptive of these events than such inspired utterance of these? And we are certainly living in a time where we are seeing more and more wars throughout the countries of the earth. Isaiah 13, 6 through 9, 13, 11 and 13 says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. 
Therefore shall all the hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cru cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinner there out of it. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud to seize, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. So that is Isaiah's description of the same thing that John is seeing and trying to describe. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain shall also be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion." As Isaiah 34, 2 through 3, verse 8, again, Isaiah describing John's description of the great wars of this day. For this was the day of his vengeance, which was in my heart. That's Doctrine and Covenants 133, 51. So it's going to be the sixth seal will be a time of great vengeance and wrath of God poured up out upon the nations in warfare and destruction and much sorrow. We are certainly living during this time period. Chapter 6, verse 17, the phrase, Who shall abide to stand? Before the Lord comes, the wicked and ungodly shall be slain by plague and by pestilence and by the sword. And when he descends from his cloud of when he descends with his chariots of fire, the remainder of those who are living a telestial law shall be consumed by the glory of his presence. The reason why the fire, the earth is burned by fire is because of the glory of the presence of the Lord, and that is what will burn those who are living a telestial life. Isaiah described it this way, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to enter his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Isaiah 66, 15-16 And Malachi, having more particular reference to the actual hour of his return, asked, Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? That's Malachi 3, 2. And then answers, The day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi 4, 1. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7, 1 through 2, the angels. The Lord gave Joseph Smith understanding concerning angels mentioned in Revelation 7, 1 through 2. See DNC 77, 8 through 9, and also DNC 38, 12. Revelation 7, 1 refers to four angels, the four corners of the earth and the four winds of the earth. The number four in scripture often suggests a geographical fullness, as in the four directions of a compass. Regarding the four angels of destruction, President Wolford Woodruff taught, God has held the angels of destruction for many years, lest they should reap down the wheat with the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven and are hovering over the earth awaiting to pour out the judgments. And from this very day they shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth, and there is a meaning to these things. Remember this and reflect upon these matters. For if you do your... For if you... Let me try again. If you do your duty and I do my duty, we will have protection and shall pass through the afflictions and peace and safety. For 
So according to Wilfred Rudolph in the 1800s, the four angels of destruction have been let loose. Revelation 7, 3, and 9, 4, the seal of God on their foreheads, meaning the seal or marking of the servants of God in their foreheads is a metaphor of their devotion, service, and belonging to God. Our foreheads have to do with our minds, and so we think like God. We have thoughts like God. Seal is the same term used earlier in the New Testament to describe faithful baptized saints who have received the Holy Spirit of promise. Bearing this seal protects the faithful from divine judgments upon the wicked. In this sense, the seal of God in the forehead symbolizes a protection much like the Lamb's blood that ancient Israel and Egypt placed on their door frames to protect them from the destroying angels. So if we have the thoughts and the mind of the Lord and follow those thoughts that the Lord gives us and in his direct, uh, direction, follow after his directions, then we will be protected. We'll have a seal of protection. The, Joseph, the prophet Joseph Smith taught four destroying angels holding power over the four quarters of the earth until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies sealing and blessings upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. When a seal is put upon the father or mother, it secures their posterity so that they cannot be lost, but will be saved by virtue of the covenant of their father and mother, end of quote. Thus, if both parents and children have their calling and election made sure, none so involved shall be lost. All shall come forth to an inheritance of glory and exaltation in the kingdom of God. Revelation 7, verses 4 through 8, the 144,000. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 7, verse 11, the Lord explained to Joseph Smith that the number 144,000 mentioned in Revelation 7, 4 through 8, is the number of representatives out of the 12 tribes of Israel who will be, who will be obtained, or I'm sorry, who will be ordained to assist others in their quest for exaltation. It is not, as some believe, the total number of people who will be exalted. The church of the firstborn refers to those who will be exalted and become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Members of the Lord's earthly church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who live righteously and receive the ordinance of exaltation, will become members of the Lord's heavenly church, usually referred to as the Church of the Firstborn. See Doctrine and Covenants 93, 20 through 22. The house of Israel was, of course, a distinct and chosen people in pre-existence, with great hosts of our fathers' favored and faithful children being foreordained to receive mortal birth through this elect lineage. That's De Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 9. The keys and power to restore the ten tribes to their former high status in Israel and to lead them from their unknown places of lodgment in the lands north of Canaan and Assyria were given by Moses to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery on April 3, 1836. That's Dr. Covenants 1, 10, 11. These keys now reside in the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that the remnants of Israel shall be restored before the second coming of the Son of Man is evident from the fact that 12,000 from each tribe are to receive the restored gospel and that through the ordinance of the Lord's house they are to become kings and priests or kings and priestesses who shall administer the blessings of the everlasting gospel to the Lord's elect. The tribes listed by John include Lephi, Count Ephraim, Joseph, and Manasseh separately, and omit Dan. Why Dan should lose his inheritance is not clear. Perhaps it is forecast in the patriarchal blessing given by Jacob to the head of the tribe of Dan, which said, Dan shall be a serpent by the way and an adder in the path. Genesis 49, 17. 
Or perhaps it is because a long course of idolatry and warlike conduct dissipated the strength of the Danites and left, left them less powerful and numerous than their fellows in Israel. Revelation 7, 9 and verse 13 through 14. What are these in white robes? John saw that the multitude of exalted people clothed in white robes was too large to count and came from all nations of the earth. The image of the righteous with palm branches in their hand recalls the Savior's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Just as the people during the Savior's triumphal entry gave honor and praise to Christ, the great multitude John saw fell before the throne of God and praised the great Jehovah, declaring that salvation came through him, saying, Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God. Palm branches can symbolize victory and joy. The image of what? The image of robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb refers to our being purified through the atonement of Jesus Christ, which cleansing power of the atonement came to those which came out of great tribulation. Brothers and sisters, the faithful will have to go through great tribulation. That will try our faithfulness. While serving as a member of the Seventy, Elder Lynn A. Mickelson taught the Savior stands at the door and knocks. He is ready to receive us immediately. Our response is do the work of repentance. We must abandon our sins so the cleansing can begin. The promise of the Lord is that he will cleanse our garments with his blood. He gave his life and suffered for all our sins. He can redeem us from our personal fall through the atonement of the Savior, giving himself as a ransom for our sins. He authorizes the Holy Ghost to cleanse us in a baptism of fire. End of quote. Revelation 7 verses 15 through 7. Verse 15, those who have kept the commandments and rise as kings and priests or queens and priestesses to dwell with Christ during the millennia era, serving him in his kingdom. Verses 16 through 17 mean, Israel shall now have the gospel, feast upon the good word of God, and drink from the fountain of living water. All past suffering is gone. Let's now turn to Revelation chapter 8 and what John sees and reveals to us. Revelation 8, desolation poured out. John beheld a short period of silence when the seventh seal was open, a time when the angels of heaven are awaiting the command to execute the Lord's justice. Zephaniah described a similar period of silence that preceded the ancient destruction of Judah. See Zephaniah 1, 7 through 18. The Lord's judgment and intervention are described as times when the Lord does not keep silent. See Psalms 53 through 4 and Isaiah 65, 6. Following this period of silence, John saw fire and desolation poured out during the seventh seal and preceding the second coming of Christ. Because the number seven often symbolized completion, the destruction of the seventh seal may see, be seen as preparing for the completion of God's work on earth. These destructions are described in Revelation 8, 6 through 9, 21, 11, chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. Richard D. Draper inferred, the second coming does not usher in the millennial era. The woes pronounced upon the trumpets do. Let me emphasize, Christ will not appear in glory as the millennium draws dawn, dawn, day dawns. Instead, Satan's infernal creating horses and sadistic hordes having fiery breastplates, dusky red, and sulfurous will. The millennium for the purpose of this study begins at the time the Savior commences his reign on the earth. But to begin his rule, he does not have to appear to the world. His reign begins as he collects the keys as he has given to the prophets through the ages and directs affairs personally. Daniel gives a hint 
when this will be, speaking as though it had already happened, he noted that war was made against the saints and that the wicked had power to befell until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. The prophet appears to have had in mind the great future gathering at Adam on Diamon. At that time, Adam, the Ancient of Days, will appear, as will the Savior, an account will be given to the Lord, and he will then begin to personally orchestrate all events from that point. Brother Bruce R. McConkie concludes the same when he writes, Thus our Lord is not destined to return when the 7,000 years first commences. Plagues, destructions, fire, bloodshed, war, and desolation, all of incomparable power and degree, are to sweep the earth after the opening of the seventh seal and before the second coming. These are pronounced in the 8th and ninth chapters of Revelation. Revelation 8, verse 1, silence about for about the space of half an hour. According to the apparent chronology set forth in section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, there shall be a great sign in heaven, verse 93. Then shall come the destruction of the great and abominable church, verse 94. And then, quoting D&C 88, 93 through 96, there shall be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded, as a scroll is unfolded, after it is rolled up. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled, and the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and be caught up to meet him. End of Doctrine and Covenants 88. What is meant by a half hour of silence has not yet been revealed. If it is to be reckoned on the basis of the Lord's time of 1,000 years to a day, the duration would be some 21 of our years. Interestingly, after the destruction preceding the Savior's appearance in ancient America, there was silence for many hours. See 3510.1. Revelation 8, 2-4 through four. The saints on both sides of the veil join in worshiping the Lord. The saints on earth pray while the angels burn incense on a golden altar before the throne of God, an act of devotion patterned after similar rites in ancient Israel. Revelation 8.5 The hot coals taken from the altar and cast down to earth symbolize the judgments of God to be rained down upon the wicked during the opening part of the seventh seal. Revelation 8 through 11, seven angels. The structure of Revelation 8 through 11 focuses on seven angels whose blast on their trumpets bring calamitous judgments upon the earth. Doctrine and Covenants 77 12 states that, quote, the sounding of the trumpets of the seven angels are the preparing and the finishing of Christ's work in the beginning of the 7,000 years the preparing of the way before the time of his coming, end of quote. The following chart summarizes the calamities that John saw in these chapters. First angel, Revelation 8, 7. Third part of trees and all grass are burned up. Destroying agent and possible interpretation. Hell and fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth. Speculatively, most of the plagues and destructions here announced could be brought to pass by men themselves as they use the weapons and armaments they have created. The second angel, Revelation 8, 8, verses 8 through 9. What is harmed, a third part of the sea becomes blood, third part of living creatures of the sea die, and third part of ships are destroyed. Destroying agent Possible interpretation, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Perhaps the turning of the waters of Egypt to blood was in similitude of this great latter-day plague. The third angel in Revelation 8, 10 through 11, it is the third part of rivers and waters are made bitter and many men die. The destroying agent of possible interpretation, there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. Could this result from atomic 
war fallout or pollutions from the factories of the world? Or will it be brought to pass by some other law of nature beyond our control? That we will have to wait and see. Those are good questions Brother McClunky proposes. The fourth angel is Revelation 8.12, where a third part of the sun, moon, and stars are smitten and darkened. Possible interpretation, no destroying agent is mentioned. Perhaps a merciful God withholds from us the ways and means whereby the very luminaries of heaven will cease to serve their ordained purposes. The fifth angel, Revelation 9, 1 through 12, the sun and air are darkened. Those without the seal of God are tormented five months. Possible interpretation, there arose a smoke out of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Locusts are representative symbolic of people. Lucifer opens the doors of hell, and every vile influence ascends from its evil depths as does smoke from a furnace. So dark is the smoke, and so widespread is the evil, that the sun and the air are darkened. Boy, brothers and sisters, we are getting to that point, are we? When you see all of this gender identity, sexual identity, race identity, the destruction of philosophies of these ideologies, and more that is to come. The seventh angel is Revelation 11, verses 15 through 19. Those who destroy, corrupt, waste, pervert, the earth are destroyed. The possible interpretation, the Lord himself, quote, Lo, the great millennial cometh. And Christ reigneth, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In the day there shall be one Lord, and his name one. In that day he shall make a full end of all nations. As he said, I will be your ruler when I come. And ye shall have no laws but my laws when I come, for I am your lawgiver. End of quote. That was from Brother Bruce R. McConkie. Revelation 8, verses 1 through 12, and chapter 9, Elder Bruce R. McConkie speculates most of the plagues and destructions here announced from the early days of the seventh seal are of such a nature that they speculatively could be brought to pass in large part through atomic warfare. Revelation 8, 7, hell and fire mingles with blood. Of the nation that shall rise to fight his people in that day, the Lord says, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. That's from Ezekiel 38:22. By these means, a third of all the trees, green grass on earth, are to be destroyed. The plague of hell and fire rained upon Pharaoh's Egypt in the days of deliverance of Israel from bondage was perhaps symbolic of this greater deliverance of the Lord's people by the forces of nature in the latter days. Revelation 8, 8 through 9. Unbelievable upheavals of nature and the unloosening of near unlimited power shall bring to pass the destruction of a third part of all life in and on the oceans of the world. Perhaps the turning of the waters of Egypt to blood was in similitude of this great latter day plague. Revelation 8 10 through 11. Could this be atomic fallout which shall poison a third part of the drinking water of the world? The word wor wormwood in the Bible, the plant usually represents something painful and nearly dreadly. In this case, it symbolizes the bitterness of hell. Also, the star name wor wormwood that fell from heaven may symbolize the bitterness and awfulness that comes to all those who follow the devil. Revelation 8.12, as perhaps symbolized by the thick darkness in all the land of Egypt, some forces of man or nature will blot out a third of the light of the luminaries of heaven. Revelation 8.13, and these are but the beginning of that which is to be, as wickedness is swept away to prepare the Lord's foot still for his personal habitation. So all this destruction 
that we've already have talked about saying you you have not seen anything yet. This is just the beginning of the wrath of God and his justice poured about upon a wicked world. Revelation 8, 13, and 9, 12, and 11, 14, the three woes. Elder Bruce McConkie discusses the meaning of the three woes, quote, After showing John the woes that would befall mankind before the second coming, the Lord, by an angelic ministrant, promised three more woes, which were to attend and usher in the reign of the great king. The first of these was the unbelievable destructive series of wars leading up to the final great holocaust. Revelation 9, 1-12. The second was the final great war itself, in which one-third of the host of men should be slain. And now the third woe is to be the destruction of the remainder of the wicked when the vineyard is burned by divine power and the earth changed from its telestial to its terrestrial state. End of quote. We now turn to Revelation chapter 9. This chapter announces and describes the events of the last great war on earth, the war which ushers in the coming of the Son of Man. All of its events are to be accomplished after the opening of the seventh seal, before the coming of Christ. See Doctrine and Covenants 77.13. Revelation 9.1, a star fell from heaven and was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9.1 symbolically describes the final efforts of Satan and his followers prior to the final destructions of the wicked. Satan is depicted as a star fallen from heaven. The Joseph Smith translate, translation clarify that the key was not given to Satan, but to the angel. See Revelation 9, 1 footnote A, who then opened the bottomless pit. This reading emphasizes that God has ultimate control and Satan has power only as God allows. As the beginning of the millennium, God will bind Satan and his followers. The keys of the bottomless pit meaning power and dominion over that hell where the devil's angels bow before their master's will. Revelation 9, 9-3, smoke arose out of the bottomless pit. The smoke in Revelation 9-2-3 is reminiscent of the mist of darkness in Lehi's vision of the tree of life. The smoke that emerges from the bottomless pit darkens the skies, similar to how the mist of darkness in Lehi's vision obscured view of the tree of life. The smoke may allude to all of Satan's false philosophies, temptations, deceptions, and attempts in the last days to destroy righteousness on the earth. Influenced by the temptations of the devil, wicked men, compared to locusts, begin their warfare, which have great power, like scorpions. Boy, are we living in a time of great false philosophies, ideologies, and teachings, brothers and sisters, concerning gender, concerning marriage, concerning sexuality. There is great smoke clouding the truth concerning these principles. Revelation 9.4, righteous will be protected. The descriptions of judgment upon the wicked in Revelation 8 continue in Revelation 9. The Apostle John saw that certain calamities preceding the second coming would not affect all the earth or its inhabitants, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. This corresponds with other scriptural promises that in the last days, those who are faithful will ultimately be protected. President Gordon B. Hinckley emphasized that spiritual preparation should be our first priority when seeking protection from the calamities of the last day. Quote, Someone has said it was not raining when Noah built the ark, but he built it, and the rains came. The Lord has said, If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. The primary preparation is also set forth in the Doctrine and Covenants, wherein it says, Wherefore stand ye in holy places, and be not moved, until the day of the Lord comes. D.C. 87.8 We can so live that we 
can call upon the Lord for his protection and guidance. This is our first priority. We cannot expect his help if we are unwilling to keep his commandments. End of President Hinckley's quote. Though the Lord promises protection to the righteous in the last days, the prophet Joseph Smith declared that some who are righteous may lose their lives in the trials and calamities of the last days. Quote, I explained concerning the coming of the Son of Man, also that it is a false idea that the saints will escape all the judgments while the wicked suffer. For all flesh is subject to suffer, and the righteous shall hardly escape. See DNC 6334. Still many of the saints will escape, for the just shall live by faith. Yet many of the righteous shall fall a prey to disease, to pestilence, etc., by reason of the wickedness of the flesh, and yet be saved in the kingdom of God. End of Pres President Joseph Smith's quote. Even though some of the righteous will be caught up in the death of many of the afflictions and calamities, being saved in the kingdom of God, they will turn out and be just fine. Revelation 9, 4 through 6. During this particular period of war and desolation, the evil forces will be directed against all men, save those sealed up into eternal life. For those in Zion shall pre be preserved. Hence our need, brothers and sisters, to establish Zion and to receive the seal of God upon our forehead, to receive his sealing powers in our minds and in our thoughts. The plagues and torments of this era shall so afflict men that they shall desire to die rather than to suffer more. Perhaps John has seen such things as the effect of poisonous gas or bio bacteriological warfare or atomic fallout which disable but do not kill. Revelation 9, 7 through 10, a time of great warfare. John uses images familiar to him to describe war and destruction in the last days. Locusts and scorpions are often associated in the scriptures with torment and destruction. Iron, horses, and chariots are images of warfare. Elder Bruce R. McConkie discussed possible meanings of the warfare described in Revelation 9. Quote, John here seeks to describe a war fought with weapons and under circumstances entirely foreign to any experience of his own or of the people of that day. Joel, subject to the same limitations of descriptive ability, attempted to portray the scenes in the words found in Joel 2, 1 through 11. It is not improbable that the ancient prophets were seeing such things as men wearing or protected by strong armor as troops or cavalry and company of tanks, flamethrowers, as airplanes and airborne missiles which explode, fire shells and firebombs, and even other weapons yet to be devised in an age where warfare is the desire and love of wicked men. But we are seeing that today in Ukraine, in Israel, in Africa. There are those who love war because they become rich from it. Those who make the weapons, those who rebuild the countries that are destroyed, there are those who seek war so that they can become wealthy. Revelation 9, 8, they had hair as the hair of women. John may be referring to the story of Samson and how his hair was symbolic of his power and strength. So when John says he sees an army of men with hair like women, he is probably saying that they have great strength and power. Revelation 9.11, who is Abaddon or Apollyon? Satan is the unseen head of the armies of men as they fight in the last great battles of earth. Abaddon in Hebrew means destruction, same as perdition. Satan's name in Greek, Apollyon, has the same meaning. Revelation 9, 15 through 16, 200,000, 
John recorded in Revelation 9, 15-16 that terrible destruction will be unleashed by God's messengers during the last days before the Savior's second coming. John declared that 200,000, 000, that's 200 men, will f of war will fight in the battle of Armageddon, verse 16. We do not know whether that number is symbolic or literal. John also recorded that the third part of men will be slain, see verse 15. Of this prophecy, Elder Bruce Armaconkey stated, the slain will be a third of the inhabitants of the earth itself, however many billions of people that may turn out to be. The angels were held in leash until the exact moment foreordained by God. Verse 15. So we are yet to see an army that is will be unleashed upon this earth, a wicked army guided by Satan that will cause such great destruction as God pours judgments out upon the wicked. Revelation 9, 7 through 19. Verse 17, I saw the horses in the vision and then that set on them. John describes this scene of horses using various images and symbols. He makes threefold repetition of fire and brimstone. The Jerusalem Bible says fire and sulfur. And twofold repetition of smoke and horses in Revelation 9, 17 through 18. Fire, smoke, and brimstone may describe the bombs and destructive devices associated with present-day or future warfare. Horses often represent war vehicles. By these three was the third part of men killed. Fire, smoke, and brimstone are the weapons of this mighty army that will destroy one-third of humanity. Verse 19, power is in their mouth and in their tails. The fire-breathing capacity of these lion-headed horses symbolizes the torment of hell and underscores their diabolical nature. Like the scorpions in 910, there is destructive power in the horse's tail. In fact, the tails are snakes with heads, other evidence they are sent from the devil. Revelation 9, 20 through 21, Modern Idolatry. As described at the conclusion of Revelation 9, the evil men who are not killed by the war and destruction described in earlier verses will still refuse to repent of their evil practices, including idol worship. While serving as member of the 70, Elder David R. Stone taught that a prevalent form of modern idolatry is adopting, is adopting the tastes and attitudes of of world, worldly culture that sur surrounds us. He said, quote, Our culture tends to determine what foods we like, how we dress, what constitutes polite behavior, what sports we should follow, what our taste in music should be, the importance of education, and our attitude towards honesty. It also influences men as to the importance of recreation or religion, influences women about the priority of career over childbearing, and has a powerful effect on how we approach procreation and moral issues. All too often, we are like puppets on a string as our culture determines what is cool. Seduced by our culture, we often hardly recognize our idolatry as our strings are pulled by that which is popular in the Babylonian world. End of quote. Even after all the destruction and killing, mankind still seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness. But every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. Doctrine and Covenants 1.16 Revelation 9.21 Sorceries Among the sins that the wickedness in the last days will not repent of will be sorcery. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency counseled Latter-day Saints to avoid becoming involved in sorcery or other satanic practices. It is not good practice to become intrigued by Satan and his mysteries. No good can come from getting close to evil. Like playing with fire, it is too easy to get burned. The knowledge of sin tempteth to its commission. 
The only safe course is to keep well distance from him and any of his wicked activities or nefarious practices. The mischief of devil worship, sorcery, witchcraft, voodooism, caste spelling, black magic, and all the forms of these demonism should always be avoided. End of quote. We now turn to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation 10, 1, 2, and 9, 10, a little book. A mighty angel delivered a little book to John, and he ate it up, symbolizing his mission to help gather the tribes of Israel as part of the revelation. See DNC 77, 14, and DNC 7, 1 through 3. The eating the book may suggest that John accepted his mission. It became a part of his being. That the book was sweet as honey in his mouth, but bitter in his belly, may suggest that his mission would involve many sweet and joyous experiences, but also rejection and painful experiences. Ezekiel also ate or internalized a book. According to John Whitmer's account of a conference in the church in June of 1831, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon Joseph in an unusual manner, and he prophesied that John the Revelator was then among the ten tribes of Israel who had been led away by Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion to again possess the land of their fathers. As far as I know, that's the last I've ever heard a prophet describe where John, the beloved who is translated, is. So perhaps he's still among the lost ten tribes preparing them. Revelation 10, 3-4, Seven Thunders. Elder Bruce Lomage Conkey describes what the seven thunders mentioned in Revelation 10, 3-4 might represent. Quote, the seven thunders which here utter their voices are the seven angels reciting in some detail that which is to be in each of the thousand-year periods of the earth's temporal continuance. It also appears that John's vision prefigured what is to be when the events occur and that the promised proclamation shall yet be made when the hour of millennial peace actually arrives. And then the first angel shall again sound his trump in the ears of all the living, the revelation recites, and reveal the secret acts of men and the mighty works of God in the first thousand years. And then shall the second angel sound his trump and reveal the secret acts of men and the thoughts and intents of their hearts and the mighty works of God in the second thousand years. And so on until the seventh angel shall sound his trump and he shall stand forth upon the land and upon the sea and swear in the name of him who sitteth upon the throne that there shall be time no longer and Satan shall be bound, that old serpent who is called the devil, and shall not be loosed for the space of a thousand years. End of quote. Revelation 10, 6 through 7, that there should be time no longer. Verse 6, that there should be no more delay, not that time as such should end and eternity begin, for the millennia era is still ahead. But as, show, but as shown in Doctrine and Covenants 88, 110, that Satan shall be bound, thus ending the time, it shall be no longer when persecution prevails. So Satan's time is no longer and persecution. The martyr shall have no longer a time to wait for the accomplishment of their prayers for the purg pur purgation of the earth by the judgments which shall remove their, their and God's foes from it. The appointed season of time of delay is at an end. The phrase, the mystery of God should be finished, meaning the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth, that portion of his work that pertains to the first 6,000 years of its completion or its temporal existence. Revelation 10.11, the phrase, thou must prophesy again before many people. John was translated, he has been made a flaming fire and a ministering angel, and he shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation who dwell on the earth. To him the Lord said, Thou shalt tarry till I come in my glory, and shall prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. 
except for his work among the lost tribes of Israel, the nations and tongues and kings to whom he has and shall prophesy have not yet been made known. Now we turn to Revelation chapter 11. Having received the divine commission to prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, and knowing that he is to remain on the earth as a mortal witness of his Lord until that holy being comes to again dwell among men, John is now commanded to be with the strength in the church in his day. Verse 1. He is made aware of the long night of apostasy ahead. Verse 2. He hears of latter-day witnesses who shall bear testimony at the very hour of the coming of the Son of Man, verses 3 through 14. And he hears the angelic pronouncement that the King of earth and heaven shall reign again among mortals, verse 15. Revelation 11.1, 1, the phrase read like unto a rod, meaning a heavenly being hands John a long reed or stick to use as a measuring tool and tells him to measure the temple, its altar, and the worshippers. Similarly, a golden reed is used to measure the wall and gates of the celestial temple, and the future temple of Jerusalem is measured with a measuring reed. That is six cubits, about ten feet in length. Chapter 11, verse 1, Rise and Measure. John is told to go and measure, just as a carpenter measures before constructing or repairing. The thing that John measures, the temple, the altar, and the worshipers, are established by God or protected from his judgments. They are not slated for destruction. The outer court and beyond which have not been measured will be affected by his judgment. John is commanded to perform a symbolic action that anticipates our own day. The temple and altar and worshipers represents the faithful, or Zion. The outer court represents the unfaithful and unbelieving, or the world. What is thus measured is under God's special protection, as in Ezekiel and in Zechariah. Perhaps the measuring of the temple, the altar, and the worshiper symbolizes taking the measure of worthiness to partake of the blessings of the atonement. The term measure also has another application in Scripture. In contrast to the measuring of God's righteous people, the Scripture speaks of the destruction of the wicked without measure, meaning to the fullest extent when the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure. DNC 1.9 Mine indignation is soon to be poured out without measure upon all nations, and this will I do when the cup of their iniquity is full. Doctrine and Covenants 101 verse 11 and 109.45 Chapter 11 verse 1, Temple of God. The Greek word used here for temple is naos, which refers to the sanctuary itself, namely the holy place and the most holy place, not the outer courts. This temple was not Herod's temple, which had been destroyed in 70 AD, more than 20 years before John is instructed to measure the temple. This temple may be the temple that will yet be built in Jerusalem in the last days, as the prophets have declared. Ezekiel, for instance, saw the description in some detail of this temple in Ezekiel 40-46. through Joseph Smith also spoke of the future temple, quote, Judah must return, Jerusalem must be rebuilt, and the temple and water come out from under the temple, and the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. It will all take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, end of quote. The phrase temple of God also has symbolic meaning. Paul likened the saints to a temple when he asked, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Later Paul wrote, Ye are the temple of the living God. On another occasion he likened Christ to the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets to the building's foundation. The saints together with the apostles and prophets are an, an holy temple in the Lord. That is to say, the community of saints, speaking of those who attend the temple and worship within its walls, constitute a temple of God. 
These are measured by John and receive protection from the coming judgments. Remember, that doesn't mean that you all will be protected physically. If you die physically, but you're still faithful and have the seal of God and have worshipped in the temple and keep your temple covenants, you'll be saved in exaltation. Therefore, you will be fine. Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1, altar. This altar may refer to the altar of incense or to the great altar of sacrifice. In our day, this altar refers to the sacred altars of our temples and those who surround them or kneel at them for sacred ordinances. The ordinances and keeping of the Lord's covenants with them protect the saints from God's judgments. Verse 1, the phrase, them that worship therein. John measures temple worshipers, speaking of saints who worship in our temples today to ensure their protection from God's wrath and judgments. Again, remember, the most important protection is spiritual protection, that you stay faithful and then that you will enter God's kingdom. Revelation 11, 2-3 and 9-11, 40 and 2 months. The angel told John that Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot 40 and 2 months. 40 and 2 months is the equivalent of 3 and a half years. Likewise, the two witnesses mentioned in verse 3 would prophesy and testify of Jesus Christ for 1,260 days, or approximately three and a half years. They would be slain and their bodies would lie in the street for three and a half days. In the scriptures, particularly in Revelation, the number three and a half often describes a limited period of tribulation during which evil forces are allowed to do their work. Since three and a half days is half of seven, which symbolizes perfection and completion, it may re represent imperfection and apostasy. It may also suggest that God will not allow evil to go unchecked. Evil's time is bounded and its limits are set. Revelation 11, 3 through 12, two witnesses. The events in Revelation 11 will transpire prior to the second coming to the Mount of Olives to deliver the Jews from destruction. The two witnesses are two prophets that are to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days at the time of the restoration and to prophesy to the Jews after they are gathered and have built the city of Jerusalem in the land of their fathers. Verses 11 through 14, these two prophets appear to possess the sealing power of the priesthood, with which they, like prophets before them, are able to control the skies and smite the earth with plagues. Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, no doubt, referring to these two prophets, they will be members of the Council of the Twelve or the First Presidency of the Church. Chapter 11, verse 4, two olive trees and two candlesticks, meaning the imagery of olive trees recalls the book of Zechariah, in which he asks an angel, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlesticks and upon the left side thereof? The angel's response indicates that the two prophets have been anointed with holy oil in the Lord's temple. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Those who have been through the temple and have had their washing anointings, that makes more sense to you. The two prophets will be like candlesticks holding up the light of Christ to shine in the darkness. Some will see the light, recognize their good works, and glorify their Father which is in heaven. Some will recognize Jesus through the prophet's testimony. Therefore, hold up your light, that it may shine into the world. Behold, I am the light which ye should hold up, that which ye see, that which ye have seen me do. 3 Nephi 18, 24. Standing before the God of the earth, this phrase recalls Zechariah 4, 14, that two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The expression, standing before God, seems to place the two witnesses in a temple setting, as does Zechariah 4. Menahem Haran wrote, In general, any religious activity to which the biblical text applies the formula, 
quote, before the Lord, unquote, can be considered an indication of the existence of a temple. This expression actually belongs to the temple's technical terminology. Chapter 11, verse 5, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths. The two prophets will possess great power similar to that of Moses to call upon heaven and cause fire to consume those who attempt to hurt them or to hinder their work. The two will call upon God with their mouth, and God will respond by sending the consuming fire. Although these are two witnesses, the singular mouth is used, their mouth, perhaps indicating their message will be united. Chapter 11, verse 6, Power to shut heaven that it rain not. The two prophets will possess the sealing powers whereby they perform great miracles among the people, including closing the sky so that it does not rain and thus causing famine in the land. When such occurs, the land does not yield her fruit, and the people begin to perish quickly from off the good of the land. The prophet Elijah from Gilead also prayed earnestly and shut heaven, causing a great famine in the land. He promised King Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but great famine was throughout all. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah's prophecy was fulfilled, and the heavens were shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. Many during mortality have held power over earth's waters, including Enoch, Moses, Jesus Christ, and others. God, of course, is the power behind these miracles. Chapter 11, verse 6, to smite the earth with all plagues. Doctrine and Covenants 8497 promises, quote, and plagues shall go forth and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness, end of quote. The plagues that will occur at the command of the two prophets are similar to those spoken of in Exodus when Moses, through the power of God, smote the land of Egypt with numerous plagues. The two prophets' plagues may be the same as the seven plagues of the seven angels. At least the prophets' plagues anticipate and perhaps foreshadow the great plagues that will be poured out of the bowls or vials identified in Revelation verse 16. I'm sorry, chapter 16. Oh, chapter 11, verse 6, as often as they will. This phrase suggests that the prophets will conduct miracles as necessity demands, which may be frequent during this three-and-a-half-year ministry. Chapter 11, verse 7, finished their testimony. God will, God will protect the two prophets until they complete their mission. Then he will permit them to be killed. Their testimony will focus on Jesus Christ. Verse 11, seven, oh, chapter 11, verse 7, beasts that ascend out of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit was discussed in Revelation 9, 1 through 2. The beast identified here may be the same beast as identified in Revelation 13, 1 through 8. In chapter 11, verse 7, make war against them and kill them. Satan and his followers have always made war with the righteous. The beast will war against the two prophets. So that's the beast that's identified in Revelation 13 is Satan or Saint, or those who are controlled by Satan, whether it's governments, organizations, or whatever. The beast will war against the two prophets, probably with the aid of kings of the earth and their armies, and succeed in killing them. That the beast is making war against only two individuals underscores the tremendous power the two will hold, great power greater than that of the armies of the earth. The beast and his followers will also make war against others, including Jesus Christ, but Jesus will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Chapter 11, verse 8, their dead bodies shall lie in the street. The two prophets' bodies will lie in the street for three and one-half days, while the people of the earth rejoice and send gifts 
to one another. Allowing the dead to lie in view of their enemies was considered extremely disrespectful in ancient times. Joseph Mack Smith taught, quote, It has always been considered a great calamity not to obtain an honorable burial, and one of the great curses the ancient prophets could put on any man was that he should go without a burial, end of quote. Chapter 11, verse 8, Great City, which allegorically is called Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem is called the Great City, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem is allegorically called Sodom and Egypt because of the wickedness of her inhabitants. Sodom, we recall, was destroyed for her abominations and gross wickedness, and Egypt, called the beast of the kingdoms, symbolizes worldliness and oppression of the Lord's people. Babylon is also called the great city, implying that great city symbolizes all of earth cities that contain iniquitous and godless people who war against the Lamb and his witness. One commentator writes that the great city is every city that embodies self-sufficiency in place of dependency on the Creator, achievement in place of repentance, oppression in place of faith, the beast in place of the lamb, and murder in place of witness to God. Chapter eleven, verse nine: They of the people and kin- they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. This expression signifies totality of people and indicates that the worldwide community will be involved, at least emotionally, in the slain of the two prophets. Chapter 11, verse 9, see their dead bodies three and a half days. The two prophets' bodies will lie in a highly visible place for all to see. The time of three and one half days corresponds to the time that Jesus' body rested in the tomb. Perhaps more importantly, this period also parallelizes, parallels the number that belongs to the wicked, the cutting short of righteousness. Chapter 10 Chapter 11, verse 10, they that dwell upon the earth. This expression of note was the people and kindreds and tongues and nations spoken of in verse 9. Chapter 10, 11, I'm sorry, verse 10, shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall sing gifts to one another. Earth's inhabitants celebrate and gloat over the death of the two prophets who had tormented them by bringing forth famine and plagues who had testified of Jesus Christ. This celebration indicates the gross darkness that belongs to the wicked during this period. That's not satisfied with the spilling of the blood of God's witnesses and leaving their bodies in the streets for all to see, they will also party, revel over their deaths, and exchange gifts. The wicked will feel they have won the victory. Chapter 11, verse 11. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. These phrases recall the promises of the resurrection of the house of Israel in Ezekiel 37.10. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Chapter 11, verse 11, Great fear fell upon them which saw them, so far taught that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and indeed the revelers have only three and a half days to celebrate the prophet's death before they experience great terror as they witness them come back to life. Can you imagine here? These two powerful prophets that have poured out great judgments, have power to withstand the armies of the world, are finally killed and they're reveling that we finally built these two powerful men. And then three and a half days later, they are resurrected. Can you imagine the fear that will be in the hearts of the wicked? Chapter 11, verse 12, they heard a great voice from heaven. The voice of a heavenly being instructs the two witnesses to come up hither. This is the dramatic moment when God bears his arm before the nation and begins to bring an end to the rule of evil. Death is the ultimate tool of evil. What happens when even that power is removed? All others will be destroyed as well, leaving the wicked completely powerless. 
Chapter 11, verse 12, the verse, they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. The prophet's ascension into heaven in a cloud parallels the ascension into heaven of both Elijah and the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 13, same hour was there a great earthquake. A great earthquake coincides with the opening of the sixth seal, and another great earthquake occurs after the seventh seal, after the seventh angel pulls out his bowl. The earthquake is identified here, accompanies the prophet's ascension into heaven, and serves as another testimony subsequent to the testimony of the two prophets that God lives. Chapter 11, verse 13, tenth part of the city fell. The earthquake causes great destruction to the city's buildings, roads, and other structures. Chapter 11, verse 13, were slain of men 7,000. The earthquake destroys a great number of individuals represented here as 7,000. Verse 13, the phrase, the remnant have glory, gave glory to God of heaven. To give glory to God at the very least and acknowledge his hand in the resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses and in the earthquake. Chapter 11, verse 14, second woe is passed. These words clearly show God's deep displeasure in the inhabitants of the earth, specifically those who chose sin and worldliness and will not repent. God's pronouncement of a woe results in a condition of woe on the earth. Woe denotes great trouble and anguish. Chapter 11, verse 15, seventh angel sounded. Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel, blows his trump. The phrase, there were great voices in heaven, meaning the voices are not identified, but they may belong to the twenty and four elders, the four living creatures, or the great multitude of exalted souls in heaven. The phrase, kingdoms of this world, meaning the world's kingdoms are like wild beasts who have no owner or master and are untamed and uncivilized and often bloodthirsty. Joseph Smith explained, you there see that the beast in Daniel 7.16 are spoken of to resent the kingdoms of the world, the inhabitants whereof were beastly and abominable characters. They were murderers, corrupt, carnivorous, and brutal in their dispositions. The lion, the bear, the leopard, and the ten-horned beast represented the kingdoms of the world, said Daniel. End of Joseph Smith's quote. When Christ, the Lamb of God, comes in great and glory, in great power and glory, he will destroy these beasts, or meaning these earthly kingdoms, and establish his perfect kingdom. For he has promised, I will be your ruler when I come. At that time, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Lord and his name one, and he will make a full end of all nations. Oh, what a glorious that day will be when we can finally get rid of these prostituted governments we now live under, these corrupt governments, especially even in the United States. Daniel envisioned these things, saying, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and there was given the Son of Man dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 14. Chapter 11, verse 15, the phrase, He shall reign forever and ever. The tenth article of faith says, that Christ will reign personally upon the Lord. Also, the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh. Dr. Cummins 133.25 Chapter 11, verse 17, the phrase, Lord God Almighty. This title of God, also used by Jacob, describes God's supreme power to reign upon the earth. Because thou hast taken thee to because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. That power was manifest by God's triumph in raising the two prophets from the dead. Evil had appeared to triumph, but God turned seeming defeat into victory. Glorious victory. Do what they will, the powers of evil cannot frustrate the purpose of it alone. He alone is almighty. Chapter 11, verse 17, which art, which wast, and art to come. 
This expression is a commentary on the Hebrew name Yahweh. Jehovah is the usual Anglo anglicized form, which denotes existence or being. Revelation 1.18 further explains, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Similar expressions in Revelation include Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And other scriptures read, Listen to the voice of the Lord your God, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, whose course is one eternal round, the same as today, as yesterday, and forever. Dr. Covenants 35.1 And the Lord Omnipotent, who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity. Moses 3.5 Each expression encompasses all states of existence for God, past, present, and future. Hence, Jehovah is endless. Endless is my name, which says in Moses 1.3, eternal and everlasting. Chapter 11, verse 18, the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Psalms 2 helps us understand this section of Revelation. The psalmist wrote, quote, Why do the he heathens rage? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's in Psalms 2, verses 1 through 2, and Psalms 46, 6. That is to say, the nations are angry, and they and their leaders continually war against God and Jesus Christ. The psalmist prophesied that the Lord will become the earth's king and ruler and receive as his possession the uttermost parts of the earth. Psalms 2.8 The Lord's wrath, thy wrath that is come, is also mentioned in Psalms 2, where the psalmist writes that the Lord shall speak unto them, the heathen, in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Psalms 2.5. Modern revelation also speaks of the Lord's wrath. Hearken, O ye people who, who profess my name, saith the Lord. For behold, my anger is killed against the rebellious, and they shall know mine arm and my indignation in the day of visitation and of wrath upon the nations. Dr. Covenants 56.1. And with the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, and with famine and plague and earthquake and thunder of heaven, and the first fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of an almighty God, until the consumption decree hath made a full end of all nations. That was Doctrine and Covenants section 87. Verse 6. Talk about climate change, brothers and sisters. The only climate change there is is wickedness. That's what's causing different things, the judgments of God down here upon the earth. You want to change climate change? How about we keep the Sabbath day holy? How about we keep the commandments and follow our covenants made in the temples? That will cause climate change. Chapter 11, verse 18, time of the dead that they should be judged. The first resurrection pertains to the prophets and saints of God. For the day cometh that the Lord shall utter his voice out of heaven, and heaven shall shake and earth shall tremble, and the trump of God shall sound both long and loud, and shall say to the sleeping nations, Ye saints, arise and live. Ye sinners, stay and sleep till I shall call again. Later, John will witness the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Chapter 11, verse 18, Give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. God's reward to his people and saints is thus described. Quote, and thus we saw the glory of the celestial, which excels in all things, where God, even the Father, reigns upon his throne forever and ever. Before those throne, all things bow in humble reverence and give him glory forever and ever. They who dwell in his presence are the church of the firstborn, and they shall see as they are seen and know as they are known, having received of his fullness and of his grace, and he makes them equal in power, in might, and dominion. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 92 through 95. Chapter 11, verse 8, small and great. 
individuals from all walks of life, both prophets and saints, who fear or reverence God's name will receive an eternal reward. Chapter 11, verse 18, destroy them which destroy the earth. Those who belong to Babylon, whose citizens worship the beast and have received his mark in their forehand, heads or hands, have sought to destroy the earth's inhabitants. Jesus Christ will destroy these destroyers and every corruptible thing, both man and or beast of the field or fowls of the heavens or of the fish of the sea. Note that Jesus comes to save the earth from those who would destroy it. Even the second coming is an act of salvation. Chapter 11, verse 19, Temple of God was opened in heaven. The celestial kingdom called the temple of heaven is open to receive the saints who are resur resurrected, judged, and found worthy to enter. The phrase, Ark of His Testimony, this expression refers to the Ark of the Testimony, also called the Ark of the Covenant, which rested in the Israelite temple's Holy of Holies, into which only the high priest was permitted to enter once every year. The Ark was a box that held three sacred items symbolically connected to Jesus Christ's power and atonement, Aaron's rod, the pot of manna, and the tablets of the law. The lid or covering of the ark served as Jehovah's seat of atonement or mercy seat. It was situated between two large golden cherubim. John's statement that there was seen in the temple the ark of his testimony indicates that all exalted saints, not just the high priests of the earthly temple, will be privileged to gain access to Jesus Christ and his sacred heavenly dwelling. The phrase lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hell. The lightnings and thunderings portray the power and brilliance associated with God's presence and demonstrate that he has some supreme control over the elements of the earth. The voice out of the throne may be those of God and the Lamb. The terms lightnings, thunderings, and voices are found four times in Revelation and are often accompanied with descriptions of earthquakes and hell. Let's now go to Revelation chapter 12. Chapter 12 to 14 are interludes in the book of Revelation. Many of the events described in Revelation 6 through 11 seem to be chronological in order. This can lead the reader to expect this pattern to continue. However, Gerald N. Lund, who later became a member of the, of the 70, explained that there are several interludes during which the book of Revelation briefly diverts from its chronological sequence. As one studies the book, it becomes clear that there are places in chronological flow where the Lord pauses to teach us important information before moving on. A teacher may do this as he moves through a lecture, pausing in his logical development to say, Now, before we go further, I need to make sure you understand something. Such teaching interludes seem to apply to John's vision. For example, 1. The joy of those who are saved. Before launching to a grim description of judgment, John sees an innumerable company of righteous and powerful reminder that not all on earth will be wicked and will suffer God's judgment. Two, the little book interlude. In the midst of a visited description of the Battle of Armageddon, there is another pause. An angel gives John a little book to eat, which we learned is a symbol of John's ministry. Since the apostle was translated and was to live through all the events he saw, the Lord seems to pause to show him what part he will have in all of it. Number three, the kingdom's interlude, Revelations 12 through 14. This is the longest and perhaps the most difficult interlude to understand. The three chapters seem to comprise an overview of mankind's history from the pre-mortal existence to the second coming as it pertains to the kingdoms of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the dragon, Satan. When John hears that the kingdoms of the world are to become the kingdoms of Christ, it is though the Lord stops to teach more about these two different classes of kingdoms. And number four, another intrude that recounts the joy of those who are first saved, similar to the first, Revelations chapter 15. Revelations 12, 1 through 2, verse 5 and 7, the woman brought forth a man-child. 
In Revelation 12, verses 1 through 2, verse 5 and 7, John saw in vision a woman who gave birth to a child. The Joseph Smith translation reads as follows. Note that verse 5 becomes verse 3 in the Joseph Smith translation. It reads, And there appeared a great sign in heaven in the likeness of things on earth, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain, to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and his throne. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child, nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains, and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. These clarifications confirm that Satan will not prevail in his war against God's kingdom on earth. They also teach that the woman represents the church of God, and that the child she gives birth to is the kingdom of our God and his Christ. The church of God is at this time an ecclesiastical organization only. But when the Savior comes again and makes a full end of all nations, the kingdom of God will also have political jurisdiction over all people on the earth. The purpose of the church is to prepare its members to live forever in the celestial kingdom or kingdom of heaven. During the millennium, the kingdom of our God will be both political and ecclesiastical. Revelations 12, verse 1, the sun, the moon, and the twelve stars. We learn from Latter-day Scripture that those who inherit the celestial kingdom will receive glory likened to that of the sun. The image of a woman clothed with the sun may symbolize the church's role in preparing its members for the future glory of the celestial kingdom. The crown of twelve stars upon the head of the woman likely refers to the twelve apostles who preside over the affairs of Christ of the affairs of the church under Christ, Jesus Christ's direction. John also saw the moon under the woman's feet. Although Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the possible meaning of this image, quote, As the moon shines by reflected light, so do all earthly churches and kingdoms. They are under, beneath, and lower than the true church. The highest eternal reward they can offer is terrestrial kingdom, whose glory is like the moon. End of quote. The Joseph Smith translation, 1-3 phrase, rule all nations with the rod of iron, meaning we learn from the Book of Mormon that the rod, that the iron rod is the word of God. So John may be saying that when God and his kingdom rule the earth, it will be ruled by the word of God. President George Albert Smith said, quote, the Constitution is as much from God as the Ten Commandments. The Constitution is God word or law politically. And Doctrine and Covenants 10177 says, According to the laws and conditions of the people which I have suffered to be established and should be maintained for the rights of protections of all flesh, according to just and holy principles. End of DNC 101. Back to uh, George Albert Smith. Thus, when Christ comes to rule and reign, he will, do, he will do so spiritually and politically with the Constitution being the word of God that were governed politically. End of quote. The Joseph Smith translation 12 verses 3, 4, and 6 through 10, a war in heaven. These verses in Revelation 12 are apparent parenthetical reference to the war in heaven. The red dragon is a representation of Satan, who with his followers waged the war in heaven against Heavenly Father and his father's children. The third part of the stars of heaven are that portion of the host of heaven who followed Satan in the pre-mortal war in heaven and were cast out. Elder Bruce R. McConkey described the conflict that occurred in heaven, quote, what kind of war? The same kind that prevails on earth. The only kind Satan, the spirit, 
beings can wage, a war of words, a tumult of opinions, a conflict of ideology, a war between truth and error, between light and darkness, and the battle lines are still drawn. It is now on earth and it was in heaven. Every man must choose which general he will follow. End of quote. Boy, is it ever a war of ideologies. When you can say that a woman can become a man, a man can become a woman, Satan is certainly f fighting a war of ideologies and opinions and stupid ideas. President Boyd K. Packer, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, elaborates on how we can find protection during the spiritual war. Quote, Satan is determined to disrupt our Heavenly Father's plan and seeks to control the minds and actions of all. This influence is spiritual, and he is abroad in the land. But despite the opposition, trials, and temptations, you need not fear, fail, or fear. Youth today are being raised in enemy territory with a declining standard of morality. But as servants of the Lord, I promise you that you will be protected and shielded from the attacks of the adversary if you will heed the promptings that come from the Holy Spirit. End of quote. To Gerald Smith translation of Revelations 12.4, A Great Red Dragon, the dread the dragon represents the devil or Satan. The red here is the color of fire, symbolizing the indiscriminate destruction of the dragon-like fire. The dragon destroys all in its path. Red is also the color of sin, murder, and bloodshed. Chapter 12, verse 4. Seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon their heads. Satan is found in many places, and he rules over many nations, represented by the seven crowns on seven heads. Horns are a symbol of power. The number ten suggests that Satan has great power, but it is neither perfect nor complete. Such complete, such complete power, represented by twelve horns, resides in the Lamb. Yet the seven Crowns indicates that Satan has perfect, complete power on earth, at least for a time. This description of the dragon is repeated in relation to one of his followers as a beast from the sea. Revelation 13, 1. 12, verse 4. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. This passage refers to the third of the host of heaven, who are cast out with Satan after the war in heaven. Job also refers to the premortal spirit children of God as stars. This idea is repeated in 12, verse 8, chapter 12, verse 8. The Joel Smith translation of Revelation 12, 5, what is the meaning of the woman going into the wilderness? The woman fleeing into the wilderness is symbolic of Satan driving the ancient church into the period of the great apostasy, when the authority of the priesthood was taken from the earth following the death of Jesus Christ and his apostles. The Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 12, 5, the phrase, She had a place prepared of God, meaning the Lord had foreseen that Satan would persecute the church and was prepared to withdraw the keys and authority from earth to keep them with himself until the restoration. Chapter 12, verse 5, they should feed her there. In place of feed, other versions use taking care of, different versions of the Bible, or nourished, or sustained. The sense of the passage is that the Lord will not allow the church to die, but will keep it in care until it is time to restore the gospel to the earth. Chapter 12, verse 5, 1,203 score years. The clarification of years in the Joseph Smith translation, rather than the King James Version days, is an important one, for the number suggests the length of time the church will be gone from the great earth during the great apostasy, 1,260 years. If we consider that the apostasy ended in 1820, when the silence of the heavens was broken during the Joseph Smith's first vision, or in 1830, when the church was formally organized, then the 1,260-year period began in A.D. 570 or 560. But we know that the world had plunged deep into apostasy centuries 
before that time. Perhaps John saw the Renaissance and later Reformation as part of the restoration of the gospel. Latter-day prophets have taught that events of these periods did indeed pave the way for the restoration. The Renaissance began to bring light to the Dark Ages in the 14th and 15th centuries. A key date in the Renaissance was Gutenberg's intervention inter, in, invention of the printing press in about 1451 A.D. Less than a century later, in 1570, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the castle in Wittenberg, Germany, sparking the beginning of the Reformation. If we count 1,260 years before Lucifer, uh, Luther prose test, we get a date of two, A.D. 257. If we count backwards from Gutenberg, the resultant date is A.D. 191. We could likely find other dates from which to measure the end of John's 1,260 years, but all such efforts are, more, are no more than speculative. The important point is that John saw an extended period of widespread apostasy followed by immeasurable blessings of the rest restoration of the gospel, Revelation 14.6. That is probably the basic and most important understanding we can come to here. The apostasy would last a very long time. In chapter 12, verse 14, 1,260 years is given differently as a time and times and a time and a time, which may mean one year time plus two years time plus half a year, half a time, which equals three and one half years. Or again, 1,260 days. Perhaps in prophet's time, a prophetic day sometimes equals a mortal year. Compare the similar time period, 40 and 2 months, chapter 11, verse 2, or 1,203 score days in chapter 11, verse 3, or three and one half years during which Jerusalem will be besieged and the two prophets would testify in power. In the latter instance, those time periods seem to be literal rather than symbolic months and days. The number 42 often signifies the period when righteousness is cut short and the wicked dominate the righteous. There will be a period in the last days when evil will reign. Even the powerful prophets of God, the two witnesses in the next verse, will be destroyed. Evil will win for the moment, but only until God's full power is unleashed. The number 42 is manifest, is manifest scripturally in several ways, each of which equals three and one half. The specific meanings of these time periods has not been revealed, the psalm, though some may have come to a private understanding through personal revelation. As an angel told Daniel, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12.10 To those Smith translation of Revelation 12.9, the phrase, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, John here seems to be differentiating between the voice and the vision and the normal voice of the Spirit. The voice and the vision is not a still small voice, but a loud voice proclaiming to all the goodness of God. The loud voice may be the voice of an angel. Jules Smith translation from chapter 12, verse 9, the phrase, Now has come salvation, strength. When Satan casts from heaven, the Lord's plan can now begin to be effected among his children. Satan opposed that Satan opposed the salvation that God would send through his only begotten Son. Now Satan is banished from heaven, and the plan can move forward, bringing redemption and spiritual blessings to all who will receive them. Other versions clarify the meaning of the strength here. The New English Bible says, This is the hour of victory for our God, the hour of his sovereignty and power. Joseph Smith translation of 12.9, the phrase, The kingdom of our God, the power of our Christ, meaning, with the great omnipotent of God's kingdom cast down, that kingdom is now ready to be established. I'm sorry, with the great opponent of God's kingdom cast down, that kingdom is now ready to be established. Christ will now go forth with power to perform the atonement and bless all mankind. Revelation 12.10, the accuser of our brethren, devil, Satan. 
not used in the Old Testament. Devil is a word found in the New Testament, which was translated from the Greek rather than Hebrew, which means false accuser or slanderer, which is one of Satan's primary tactics against God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the followers of Christ. We learn from modern revelation that Satan was a liar from the beginning. The word Satan means adversary. He stands in opposition to good and to all who embrace the Lord and his goodness. The phrase, the accuser of our brethren, Satan calls good evil and evil good. He accuses those who are righteous, our brethren, of being evil. Often his accusations will be made through the mouths of his followers on earth. Interestingly, the Hebrew word for Satan means to accuse. Accuse them before God day and night, the phrase meaning Satan never ceases from his work. He seeks constantly, both day and night, to undermine the righteous. And as in the story of Job, he makes false accusations directly to the face of God. The Joel Smith Translation, Revelation 12, verse 11 and 13, verse 8, by blood and testimony. In Revelations 12, 11, an angel declared that Christ's followers overcame Satan and his followers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This was in the pre-earth life. One truth we learn from the scriptures is that the saving power of the atonement was already in place in the pre-mortal world. For Christ is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Because we are here on earth, we know that in the pre-mortal world, we trusted in Heavenly Father's plan for our redemption and drew upon the blessings of the atonement and our testimonies to overcome Satan. So if we did that in the pre-earth life, wouldn't it make sense that that is how we will overcome him today, now, in earth? In mortality, we continue to overcome Satan in the same manner, by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ and by the word of our testimonies. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the power of testimony. Quote, A strong testimony gives place, comfort, and assurance. It generates the conviction that as teachings of the Savior are constantly obeyed, life will be beautiful, the future secure, and there will be capacity to overcome the challenges that cross our path. A testimony grows from understanding truth, distilled from prayer, and the pondering of scriptural doctrine. It is nurtured by living those truths and faith and secure confidence that the promised results will be obtained. Your personal security and happiness depends on the strength of your testimony, for it will guide your actions in times of trial and uncertainty. End of quote. And we have certainly been learning about times of uncertainty here in the book of Revelations that are happening now and will continue. The Joel Smith translation of Revelations 12, verses 11 through 12, they keep the testimony even unto death. The Joel Smith translation adds several words to verse 12, 11, quote, They loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. This addition suggests that Christ's followers valued and loved their testimonies of the Lord and his gospel more than their own lives. There are multiple references in the book of Revelation to individuals who were tested and tried in the war waged against evil even unto death. The loud voice from heaven continued to speak to John by declaring that the heavens and ye that dwell in them should rejoice because of the righteousness of the saints. The Joseph Smith translation then adds these further insights, quote, And after these things I heard another voice saying, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, yea, and they who dwell upon the isles of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, end of quote. The phrase, after these things, may indicate that the righteous had a period of rejoicing after the war in heaven, for good had triumphed over evil. However, after this period, there came a time of woe on the earth, because Satan and his followers came down to earth with great wrath. Revelations 12, 12, after these things. This phrase is an addition found in the Joseph Smith translation. Its inclusion does more than suggest a sequence in the vision, which it is implied anyway. The words seem to 
create a separation between rejoicing in heaven in 1211 and the woe on earth in 1212. I heard another voice. Apparently, the voice that proclaims rejoicing in heaven is different from the voice that proclaims the woe on earth. This is another edition found in the Joseph Smith translation. Joseph Smith 1212 woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The book of Revelation has other woes pronounced on the inhabitants of the earth, plagues and judgments that will cause much loss of life and destruction. But this woe is the greatest, that Satan will dwell unseen among father's children on earth and will use his lies and deception to bring spiritual death to many. This judgment will result in the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, where Isaiah said the earth is also defiled on the under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. It's Isaiah 24, 5-6. The woe seems to have begun when Satan first entered the Garden of Eden and Tent of Eden. It will not end until Satan has been bound with chains and cast into a bottomless pit. Revelation 12.12, 12, the phrase, having great wrath. The devil is angry by nature, and he is further incensed by the fate he suffers in being cast out of heaven. In his wrath, he seeks to, to, bring, he seeks to bring us to misery like unto his own. The phrase, he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Satan is fully aware that he will be able to tempt us for only a brief moment of the eternities, and then he will be cast out forever. Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 12, 13, the phrase, he persecuted the woman, meaning persecuted the church, the woman, meaning the righteous members, as well as the organization itself, has always been Satan's first order of business. He seeks to deceive the whole world, but he seems to have... But he seems to save his persecutions for those who resist his deceptions. Jesus taught us that we would, should expect persecution and yet remain steadfast to the end. Joseph's so translation of Revelation 12:14 to the woman were given two wings of an eagle. The eagle's wings symbolize deliverance from on high, which deliverance comes with swiftness and power. The church after the days of Christ will be delivered by the same divine power that delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, as we read in Exodus. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you into myself. Joseph Smith translation 1214, flee into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished. As the children of Israel found deliverance from Egypt, symbolizing the wicked world by fleeing into the wilderness, so will the Lord's church be protected in the wilderness when Satan attacks in the meridian of time. In this case, the wilderness is a place of safety prepared for it and isolated from mortals, namely a place in the care of God. During the period the church is gone from the earth, she will be nourished by God, which probably means he will make certain that all is in readiness when the time comes for the restoration, which begins in the days of Joseph Smith. A time, a times, and a time and a half. See the common for 12.5 and what we discussed about 2,103 score years. Joseph Smith translation from Revelation 12.15, The serpent casteth out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Before the woman, or the church, actually departed into the wilderness, meaning the safety of heaven, the serpent and the devil tried to destroy her with a flood. The flood from Satan's mouth could have been a torrent of lies against the church, the flow of evil that he sent forth, seeking to overwhelm the church, ceaseless persecution, tribulation, or attacks of a wicked nation, Rome, or each of these in turn. The real point, of course, is that Satan made great effort to destroy the church and that the true power and authority of the church survived in God's care. Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 12, 6, The earth helpeth the woman, shallow, swalloweth up the flood. John's meaning here seems unclear, but nature often seems to cooperate with God, the God of nature, to protect the church long enough for God's purposes to be fulfilled. 
As Mormon testified, even the dust of the earth is obedient to the command of God. And as we learn from any, the earth itself has a spirit that loves righteousness and is pained by wickedness. See Moses 7.48. Satan's river of destruction stands in contrast to the river of life that flows from God. Joseph Smith translation 12.7, the dragon was wroth with the woman. Satan's anger against the church as an institution as well as the righteous members of the church continues. The phrase make war with the remnant of her seed, meaning Satan particularly attacks those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And his efforts are neither feeble nor sporadic. The war in heaven continues as Satan constantly brings the battle to the righteous on the earth. This verse applies not only to the gradual dwindling numbers of the righteous in Christ's church in the millennium of time, but also to the increasing number of righteous in the restored church of Jesus Christ in our day. We now turn to Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation 13, 1 through 7, John saw a beast rise out of the sea. After seeing that Satan went to make war against the remnant of the seed of the woman, John saw a beast rise out of the sea. The Joseph Smith translation indicates the beast is in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth. See Revelation 13, 1 footnote 8. The beast, many heads, crowns, and horns suggest many different kingdoms and rulers with great power. So this beast rising out of the sea, meaning organizations and governments rising out of the sea of people. The prophet Joseph Smith taught when God made use of the figure of a beast in the vision to the prophets, he did it to represent those kingdoms or governments which had degenerated and become corrupt, savage, and beast-like in their disposition. Even the degenerate kingdoms of the wicked world, the beast that rose up out of the sea should be translated the image of a beast, meaning that it was symbolic rather than literal, end of quote. Rather than attempting to specify any exact identity of the beast, it may be more profitable to note the following general characteristics about the beast. Chapter 13, 1 through 7, it had power over many nations and will come from out of the sea. Sea here may symbolize the nations of the world as water does in 1715. Thus the beast to rise to prominence from among the nations of the world. The beast had heads, horns, and crowns like its master, Satan, with one difference. Satan has but seven crowns, whereas the beast has ten. In numerology, seven is a perfect number, but ten is not, which suggests that Satan has more complete power and sovereignty than his beast, even though the beast has a great number of heads, horns, and crowns. In other words, Satan controls these wicked governments or kingdoms upon the earth. The phrase upon his head is the name of blasphemy. It is in the nature of the beast to oppose and mock God, to seek to injure his good name and reputation, and to ascribe to itself the character and attributes of God. This beast is commonly understood to represent Rome or one of the evil rulers of Rome. But if Rome does fit the description in some respect, it is only a prototype or symbol of the true beast of the last days. For even though the beast may represent a particular king or kingdom, its horns represent other kingdoms and kingdoms, and its heads seem to represent that which supports the great Babylon of earth, which is the embodiment of all wickedness. So this would be the same thing as the great whore of all the earth that is described in the Book of Mormon. Yea, Babylon, the whore of all the earth. That the great whore of all the earth are the, pro the corrupt and prostitute governments and kingdoms that are present upon the earth today that men are in charge of. Chapter 13, verse 2, the beast has power among nations and peoples. In the same way, vicious animals have power in their kingdom. The power is wielded was like the power that predatory animals have over their prayer. Prey, ruling others by fear and force. Boy, we see that today, don't we, in governments, that they 
governed out of fear and force? The dragon Satan gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The beast looks to the devil for power to rule. In turn, the devil is the master or ruler of the beast. Verse 13, verse, chapter 13, verse 3. If the heads represents kings, apparently one of the kings is wounded to the point of death, but then be healed. If the heads represent kingdoms, perhaps one of the kingdoms will seem to be destroyed, but will then come forth into power once again. This would to uh, this wound to a beast that is an enemy of Christ contrasts with the mortal wound the lamb will receive on the cross. And as the beast, which is Antichrist, is healed, so also will the true Christ be healed in the resurrection. There, are, however, the similarity ends. Jesus Christ, the lamb, will live victorious forever while his enemy, the beast, will be thrown down into a lake of fire. The people of the world see the healing of one of the heads of the beast and are amazed. Of course, the people do not view the beast as a beast. That is only the metaphor John uses to convey his message. Instead, the people are amazed at the power and resilience of the king, kingdom, or philosophy that the beast symbolizes. So this is symbolic of the different organizations or governments of the world that they are amazed at. And that the power that they have and that the wicked power that they use to control people in their countries. As an analogy, suppose that communism were to be revi revitalized and return to the world power after being re repudiated in the late 1980s. That would be a source of wonderment to all the world. That is only an analogy, not an interpretation or prophetic or future events. But the analogy may be instructive in helping us to see what John seems to be describing in these verses. That one is killed or wounded and then comes back to life, referring to kingdoms or governments that seem to have gone away but then spring up again to control people and coerce people. Chapter 13, verse 4, In John's vision, the people of the world worship the devil. This does not mean necessarily that they bow down before him or that they offer prayer or oblations to him. Rather, they may follow him, subscribe to his ways of thinking, and choose to do his will, some knowingly, some unknowingly. The people of the world worship this king, kingdom, or philosophy in the same way that they worship the devil, by following it and making it the ruling principle in their lives. The word Antichrist does not appear in Revelation, and the New Testament is found only in the epistle of John. You see the worship of Satan by the philosophy and ideology of critical race theory, of um, gender ideologies, uh, having men become women and going through operations and vice versa and all of these different ideologies that are just corrupt. They are worshiping the king of the beast, which is Satan. But this beast is unquestionably an antichrist, standing in opposition to Christ, seeking his power and authority. The people of the world offer to the beast praise and admiration that should be reserved for God. Of course, because the world really is preeminent, the Lord's really preeminent, the beast whom the people worship will be destroyed. We see people in the United States and other countries give admiration to the false philosophies of racism, of critical race theory, of all of these different ideas and try to give a preeminence that are only philosophies that stem from Satan. Chapter 13, verse 5, It opposed God and blasphemed against him. These blasphemies might claim that the beast ought to be worshipped rather than God. And speaking of the days before the second coming of Christ, Paul spoke that man of that man of sin who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showeth himself that he is God. The power to speak these blasphemies, in other words, 
Satan is trying to show that he is God. The power to speak these blasphemies is given to the beast by Satan. The beast is allowed to exercise its power for 42 months. Its number offer represents the period when the wickedness of the world will hold sway. The number 42 may not indicate an actual number of months or a specific period of time, but may instead symbolize a general prolonged but unlimited, un, but ultimately limited time of wickedness. When the 40 and 2 months are broken down into days, 1,260, and then translating to years, we have the period of time that the woman finds refuge in the wilderness. Whether or not this connection applies, however, we know that the beast will have power for a finite amount of time and that in the end the Lord and his people will emerge victoriously. Chapter 13, verse 6, the beast speaks his blasphemy against God, against God's name, against God's dwelling place, the tabernacle or temple, and against the angel and gods in heaven. The beast is opposed to all that is good and tries to garner to himself the honor and respect that should be given only to God. Think of all that is said by the apostates against God's true church, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the blasphemies that they speak against it and God himself. Revelation 13, 7, War with the Saints. John recorded that it was given to the beast from the sea to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Though the intended meaning of much of the symbolism in Revelation 13 is uncertain, one message seems clear. Satan and those who uphold his work will be at war against the saints of God. It should be said that any kingdom or government that exhibits these characteristics manifests the spirit of the beast. It is part of the Lord's eternal plan to allow the exercise of agency to both wicked and righteous on the earth, even if the wicked martyr the righteous in the process. The Lord takes the long view, knowing that in the end he will be able to exact full justice both from those who deserve punishment and for those who deserve comfort and reward. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, Satan is waging war against the members of the church who have testimonies and are trying to keep the commandments. And while many of our members are remaining faithful and strong, some are wavering, some are following, some are fulfilling John's prophecy that in the war with Satan, some saints would be overcome, end of quote. We read in Revelation 12, 11, that the righteous did not love their lives more than they loved the Lord, and thus they were willing to suffer martyrdom. Here, that resolve is put to the test for many saints who pass the test by succumbing to death at the hands of the beast. Yet that death is the very means of their own victory. Revelation 13, verse 8, the book of life. John saw that the beast would be worshipped by those whose names are not written in the book or the, of life or of the Lamb. Elder Bruce Armstrong explained that the book of life or Lamb's book of life is the record kept in heaven which contains the names of the faithful on account of their deeds. End of quote. Joseph Filling, President Joseph Filling Smith taught, quote, We are not going to be saved in the kingdom of God just because our names are on the records of the church. It will require more than that. We will have to have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if they are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then it is an evidence that we have kept the commandments. Every soul who will not keep the commandments will have his name blotted out of that book. End of quote. Lamb slain from the foundational world, meaning the promise of the atonement of Christ was made at the beginning, even before the creation of the world, and through the grace and power, the grace of God and power of the atonement took effect even from that time of that promise. Revelation thirteen ten and fourteen twelve, the patience and faith of the saints. The righteous will need patience and faith in Jesus Christ in order to withstand the evil that will prevail in the last days. Satan is going to make it look like that the evil and wickedness will never end. But we must remain patient and faithful and put our full trust in God. President Dieter, Dieter F. Uchtdorf explained, Patience is not passive resignation, nor is failing to act because of our fears. 
Patience means active waiting and enduring. It means staying with something and doing all that we can, working, hoping, and exercising faith, bearing hardship with fortitude even when the desires of our hearts are delayed. Patience is not simply enduring, it is enduring well. Patience is a godly attribute that can heal souls, unlock treasures of knowledge and understanding, and transform ordinary men and women into saints and angels. Patience is truly a fruit of the Spirit. Patience means delaying immediate gratification for future blessings. It means reigning in anger and holding back an unkind word. It means resisting evil when it appears to be making others rich. Patience means accepting that which cannot be changed and facing it with courage, grace, and faith. It means being willing to submit to all things which the Lord sees fit to inflict upon us, even as the child doth submit to his father. Ultimately, patient means being firm and steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord every hour of every day, even when it is hard to do so. In the words of John the Revelator, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, faith in Jesus Christ. End of quote. Revelation 12.11, the second beast spoke as a dragon. Revelation 13.11 tells of a second beast that John saw. He later identifies this beast as the false prophet. This second beast had two horns like a lamb, but spake as a dragon. This description suggests that the second beast will seek to appear to represent Christ while actually teaching the false doctrines of Satan. We see that in many Christian churches that appear to teach Christ but teach false doctrines. The description of the second beast is also reminiscent of the Savior's warning to beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are wavering wolves. This beast also is a symbol of one or more kings or kingdoms of the earth. The second beast causes the people of the world to worship, meaning perhaps to follow or to give allegiance to the first beast. He performs great miracles to deceive people. He gives life to the image of the first beast, and he kills many who will not worship that image. This beast or kingdom or governments also controls the economy that is buying and selling. It requires people to associate themselves with the beast if they wish to have part in that economy. This beast truly is an antichrist. He takes away the exercise of agency of the people of the world. This second beast is referred to as a false prophet later in Revelation. Perhaps this beast as a prophet represents religious philosophy and power rather than the more political power of the first beast. Or perhaps he represents Satan's sophisticated propaganda machine designed to flood the world with lies and false philosophies and religious doctrines. Like his counterpart, he will remain in power until the Lord comes. His exact identity, whether as a kingdom or a false prophet, has not been revealed. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency noted, Satan is the great imitator, the master deceiver, the arch counterfeiter, and the greatest forger ever in the history of the world. He comes into our lives as a thief in the night. His disguise is so perfect that it is hard to recognize him or his method. End of quote. One of the major techniques of the devil is to cause human beings to think they are following God's way, when in reality, they are deceived by the devil to follow other paths. We are certainly living during this time period. Revelations 13, 12 through 15. He exercises all power of the first beast. The first beast had power and great authority given by the devil. The first beast was so powerful that everyone feared war with it. The first beast had power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The second beast exercised similar power in all of these instances. True prophets of God seek diligently to bring people to believe in Christ and worship him. The second beast, the false prophet, likewise seeks diligently to bring people to worship the first beast. His message includes wonders and miracles, threats of death, which are indeed carried out, and economic coercion. Hmm. You would almost think uh, COVID and all of the coercion that was used, wouldn't you? 
These methods are so effective that the beast succeeded in his efforts. The people of the word do indeed worship the beast. This is a continuation of the worship that started earlier in chapter 13, verse 8. One commentator writes, The dragon, sea beast, and land beast are a satanic trinity that infiltrates the political world in order to deflect our worship from God, whom we cannot see, to the authorities we can see, and to deceive us into buying into a religious or belief system that has visible results in self-gratification. Boy, do we see that in government today. Chapter 13, verse 13. This beast performs great miracles, just as the Lord's true prophets performed miracles in earlier days, and as the two prophets will perform in Jerusalem. The beast will even have power to make fire come down from heaven in the sight of men, a sign and wonder like that performed by Elijah. There shall also arise false Christs and false prophets, the Lord said, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And Paul warned against him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying and wonderings. Can you see why President Nelson is pleading that we've got to have the Holy Ghost or we will not make it through? We will get deceived. Chapter 13, verse 14. Through the miracles the beast performs, he deceives the people of the world. The deception is that the beast should be worshipped rather than Christ, and that the power behind the beast is the power of God, when in reality it is Satan's power. The great imitator is able to blind the eyes and deceive the hearts of men and to put his own seal of verity, that of false miracles, on his damning philosophies. Though, thus those who place themselves wholly at his disposal have power to imitate the deeds of the prophets as the magicians of Egypt imitated the miracles of Moses and as Simon the sorcerer sought to duplicate the works of Peter. The deception of the people of the world is a commentary on their spiritual state. Satan cannot deceive a person against that person's will. Belief in the lies of Satan is always accompanied by choosing sin or choosing doubt in the work and message of the Lord. The second beast causes the people of the world to set up some kind of image of the beast. We are not able to say what this means literally. Chapter 13, verse 15, as many as worship, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This phrase indicates a true division between the people of the world. There will be two categories, those who will worship, follow, give allegiance to the beast, and those who will resist, even when threatened with death. Those who resist are those who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and love not their lives unto the death. Some have suggested that this prophecy was fulfilled in the meridian of time. After the crucifixion of Christ, all members of the early Christian church eventually died and were killed or apostatized. The one exception, of course, is John the Revelator himself who was translated. Certainly the demise of the meridian church and the martyrdom of members seem to fit at least parts of this prophecy. But many questions remain unanswered. For instance, what were the wonders and miracles performed by the Roman Empire which persecuted the Meridian Church? And in what way did the Roman Empire have worldwide influence as implied in chapter 12, verses 16 through 17? Both of these clues seem to point elsewhere to the identity of the second beast. If this passage also has a latter-day application, it is safe to say that not all the righteous saints will be killed. Many will remain to establish Zion and to greet Christ when he returns. In this dispensation, the church has been put on the earth to stay. It will not be removed from its place, though all powers of earth and hell be arrayed against it. But according to this prophecy, at some point, many of the righteous will apparently live under the threat of martyr's death. Those who will not worship the image of the beast essentially have a death warrant on their heads. Thankfully, as Nephi saw, the saints will be armed with righteousness and with power of God in great glory, and they will emerge victorious. Revelation 13, 16-17, The Mark of the Beast Earlier we saw that the righteous will receive the seal of the Lamb in their forehead, meaning we think like Christ. 
We become like Christ. We think as he thinks and wants to do as he does. This still consists in the name of the Father and appears to protect the righteous from the judgments of God. In contrast, the wicked, all who worship the beast, receive the mark of the beast on their foreheads or the right hands. Again, symbolic. They follow after, they think like the world and they act like the world and they follow after the wicked ideologies of the world. This mark appears to distinguish the wicked and enables them to buy and sell. Many have speculated on what the mark might be. Entire volumes have been written on the subject. But the Lord has not revealed the answer. So anyone who tells you exactly they know what it is are lying because God has not revealed it yet. Here is one possibility, however, that may be more sound than, more, than most speculations. The seal of God is real, but it is also figurative. It cannot be seen, but those who have it know they are gods, and they are known by him. The seal is having one's calling election made sure, being sealed up into eternal life. That seal requires no outward mark or tattoo. It represents a way, it represents a way of life and its consequences. Perhaps the mark of the beast is a parallel, though opposing idea. Those who follow the beast do his will with their hands, symbolized by the mark on the hand, and accept and adhere to his philosophy with their minds, symbolized by the mark on the forehead. Thus, those who give their lives to the beast and his philosophies constantly show who they are by the deeds of their hands and the words of the, their mouths, which reveal their thoughts. Revelation 13, 17, 18, no man might buy or sell save he have the mark. Here we see the extent and the power of the second beast. In verse 13, 15, we see that the beast kills those who will not worship the first beast. Now we see that he has another threat. He controls the word economy so much that only those with the mark can exchange the essential economic activities of buying and selling. Perhaps this means that one cannot prosper without making a part Without, without taking part in the prevailing philosophy which is inspired by Satan. Perhaps the saints will survive by living the law of concentrate, conse consecration. Brothers and sisters, we already participate in this part of the mark of the beast of buying and selling. Try going out and buying and selling with monopoly money. It's impossible. The only thing you can use is the money that is issued by the federal government that is federal currency that comes from the government. That's the only kind of stuff that you and I can use to buy and sell. We have to participate in the money that the government produces. And so we're only going to see this type of thing exponentially grow into other areas in our lives where they gain more control. I already have to participate in the the control of my government by the money that they produce. And so I have to use that mark of the beast or I cannot go into a grocery store and buy things. Chapter 13, verse 18, here is wisdom. John says, yes, that if we have understanding, we will be able to count the number of the beast, which will reveal his name. But lacking revelation, we are probably blessed served by not aligning ourselves too closely to any one interpretation. There's another area if someone tells you exactly what the name means that they don't know. One possibility is that the number is symbolic. The number seven indicates perfection. Three sevens would suggest perfection to an emphatic level. Three sixes suggest a mark falling short of perfection. Seven could be a symbolic number for Christ. Six could indicate the Antichrist. He reaches around the entire world. The second beast seems to be a symbol in which if we find embodied the great forces that oppose Christ and his people in the last days. Though we may not understand the interpretation of the number, we can seek to recognize the work of Satan in all its guises and then be willing to trust and follow Christ our Savior, whatever the cost. 
even if we cannot tell who the number may literally point to, we understand the message of this passage. Satan sends forth philosophies and servants to do his work. Many who follow Christ and his perfection will suffer greatly for their opposition to Satan's program. But eventually the wicked will fall and the righteous will prevail. And now to our last chapter, chapter 14. Verses 1 through 5, the 144,000. In contrast to the depiction of Satan's widespread influence and power recorded in 13, chapter 14 offers hope. The opening verses of 14, Revelation 14 describe a group who have the Father's name written in their foreheads, meaning they think like Christ, they follow Christ. Okay, It's not literally tattooed there, symbolic. They are clean and chaste, follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth, and are redeemed from among men, verse 4. And they are honest and without fault before God, verse 5. Through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord revealed that the 144,000 are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. So this is 144,000 of great missionaries that will have great power to seek out people together to Zion. The song that is sung by the 144,000, C14.3, may be the same song that is recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 84, 98 through 102. These verses are placed in obvious contrast to those that immediately precede them. They give the saints a message of hope. In verse 13, we see the beast who serve Satan and enslave the people of the world. Now at the beginning of 14, we see the Lamb standing in triumph on his temple mount. In Revelation 13, we see peoples of the earth who worship the beast and receive his name in their foreheads. In 14, we see a powerful group of righteous followers of Christ who worship him who remain pure and who stand steadfast before God, having his name written in their foreheads. The spreading pervasive power of the two beasts is so great that it appears that none can withstand it. But in a few verses of chapter 14, we see that the Lord and his true followers can and will withstand that power, and they will surely prevail in the end. Chapter 4, verse 1, Mount Zion. In Hebrew 12, 22, Mount Zion, Zion in the New Testament form of Zion, is associated with the heavenly Jerusalem which is another name for the portion of New Jerusalem that will descend from on high. Modern revelation clarifies further that Mount Zion shall be the city of New Jerusalem. When the Lord stands on Mount Zion in the latter days, it will appear who will stand at Mount Zion called New Jerusalem, which will be centered in Jackson County, Missouri. We have still not even come close to doing this yet. Yet he will also appear at Mount Olivet in Old Jerusalem, which is near the Mount Zion there, and the 144,000 may well be with him there as well. Chapter 1, verse 4, and 144,000. This group of 144,000 consists of those who are sealed in 718. We learn in 14, 3 through 5, that they have been redeemed from the earth, that they are virgins, meaning clean and pure, that they follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth, that they are the first fruits of God, and that they are without fault before God, having his Father's name in their foreheads, meaning in 13, 16 through 7, we saw that the people of God had the name of the beast written on their foreheads. Here the righteous have the Father's name on their foreheads. We are marked by the name of him whom we give our loyalty. The reception of the Father's name is fulfillment of the promise made to the valiant in 3.12, which records that the righteous also have written on them the name of God's holy city, New Jerusalem, as well as the new name of Christ. The Father's name is written on the righteous in symbolic rather than in a literal way. There is another way in which we may receive the name of the Father and the Son in our foreheads. A name stands for a person it belongs to. When Alma asks, can you look up to God at the day of judgment, having the name of God engraven upon your countenance? 
he may have been referring to the same idea John is speaking of here. 14.2, a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters and great thunder, meaning this voice may be that of the Lord or of the multitude of the angels of heaven. It is more likely the latter as the angels join in the song mentioned in 14.3. The sound is so loud that it is like the war, roar of the ocean or of a rushing river. It is like the clapping of mighty thunder. 14.3, they sang as it were a new song. The harpers and perhaps others in heaven are singing a song before the throne of God. The song in its setting are likely those described in 84, 96 through 102. For I, the Almighty, have laid my hands upon the nations to scourge them from their wickedness. And plagues shall go forth and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work which shall be cut short. In righteousness, until all shall know me who remain, even from the least unto the greatest, and shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and shall see eye to eye, and shall lift up their voice, and sing the voice, and the boy, and with voice together sing this new song. That's DNC 8496 102. 14 verse 3, no man could learn the song but the 144,000. The song is sung by heavenly beings before the throne of God, but there are also some on earth who can learn the song. The 144,000 who stand on Mount Zion with Christ, why are these the only ones who can learn the song? Perhaps it can be known only by revelation, or perhaps such knowledge requires a certain relationship with God and the Spirit. 14.4, they are virgins. The descriptions in 14.4 through 5 might apply to all who are exalted. Those in this case, they refer particularly to 144,000. They are virgins in having refrained from entering into any unlawful sexual intercourse. They are also virgins in having remained true to Christ as their bridegroom and having refrained from entering into spiritual adultery. The Lord has often referred to his people as a virgin. These virgins are contrasted with the worship who worship the beast in Revelation 13 and who join in the consort with the mother of harlots. That is Babylon. Christ is always referring to the whore of all the earth. The phrase follow the lamb or those who are chosen of Christ are those who follow him in all circumstances. Those do as the man said in Luke, Lord, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. The word redeemed, meaning Christ the Redeemer, has paid the price for their sins, and they are redeemed from the demands of justice and the bonds of the devil. The phrase, the first fruits of God, meaning under the law of Moses, the first fruits of the harvest were offered to God in sacrifice. As Jesus is the first fruits of all dead, being the first to be resurrected, so are the 144,000 first fruits of the harvest of salvation. 14 verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile. The 144,000 speak no deceit, being honest and true like their master. This characteristic is in contrast to the wicked, who include the liars, who saw as we saw in their worship of the beast in Revelation 13 change the truth of God to a lie. The phrase without fault before the throne of God, meaning a proper sacrifice, had to be without blemish. These 144,000 are like the lamb, without blemish and without spot. This purity and perfection, of course, is made possible through the sacrifice of the lamb. Revelation 14, 6-10, Three Angels John saw three angels, each proclaiming a message to the inhabitant, earth's inhabitants. The first angel brought the everlasting gospel to the nations of the earth. Many, many Latter-day Saints have thought that the angel represents Moroni. The angel may also represent a composite of many heavenly messengers, including Moroni, who have assisted in Latter-day restoration of the gospel. As Elder Bruce McConkie pointed out, the angel Moroni brought the message that is the word, but other angels brought the keys and priesthood, brought the keys and priesthood and the power. End of quote. In addition to bringing the ever lost gospel to the earth, the first angel announced that the hour of his judgment is come. 
fitting message for a world that has been worshiping the beast. This message prepares the reader for the second angel, whose message is that Babylon has fallen, which means that wickedness will end. Babylon's sin is described as fornication, meaning that the wicked of the world have been unfaithful to their relationship with God, placing their affections and loyalties on false gods, and inducing others to follow in the this manner of living, to drink of the wine of this sin, implies internalizing Babylon's evil ways. Because of the impending fall of Babylon in the last days, the Lord has warned the Latter-day Saints to go ye out of Babylon, meaning that we must flee the wickedness of the world. The third angel described the judgments to come upon those who worship the beast and receive his mark. They will receive God's punishing anger, described as drinking the wrath of God without mixture or without dilution. Other scriptures teach that God's wrath is poured out only when all other efforts fail to persuade men to repent. Revelation 14.11, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. The prayers and the praise of the righteous are symbolized by the smoke of incense that ascends to heaven. Chapter 5, verse 8. In contrast, the literal smoke of the burning of the city of Babylon and the burning of the wicked symbolizes the spiritual torment they suffer. Like the devil and his beast and false prophets, those who follow them, worshiping the beast and bearing his mark, will suffer torment day and night forever and ever. Again, the eternal nature and punishment of the wicked stand in contrast to eternal blessings of the righteous. Those who suffer the greatest eternal punishment, of course, are the sons of perdition. Those who inherit a lesser degree of glory than the celestial will also have eternal pangs of regret for that which they could have had, but chose in sin not to have. The phrase, no rest day or night, the torments of the damned continue without cessation, without rest forever. Chapter 12. 14 verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. In the midst of turmoil, the saints are enjoined to continue in patient trust in God and his plan to keep God's commandments and to be true and faithful in Jesus Christ. Revelation 14 verse 13, the dead which die in the Lord. John heard a voice saying, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. This suggests that although the Lord's People generally will be protected from many of the judgments to come. Some righteous will die in the calamities and tribulations of the last days. Nevertheless, those who are righteous, death is associated with peace and joy. They rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelations 14, 14 through 20, two harvests. John describes two harvests in Revelation 14, 14 through 20 which are reminiscent of those described in the parable of the wheat and the tares. First, we see Christ with a sharp sickle, which he uses to select out the righteous as if they were wheat to be harvested. The first harvest gathers out the righteous from the wicked. This gathering began when the gospel was restored in the latter days and will continue in the millennium. Next, we see an angel gathering the wicked as if they were clusters of grapes and then casting them into a wine press that represents God's wrath. We see the blood that comes from the wine press as juice flows from the crushed grapes, blood so deep it reaches to a horse's bridle. The second gathering represents God's judgments upon the wicked and the destruction that will come upon them when they, like grapes on the vine, are fully ripe in iniquity and are trodden in the winepress of the wrath of God. Though this is a horrifying scene in John's vision, it is a scene not of injustice and wrong, but of setting things right and fulfilling the law of justice. Whatever God in his wisdom and love decides to do is best for his children, both individually and as a group. Whatever God chooses to do is both just and merciful and right. Thank you. I hope this helped in some of the symbolism and the teachings and the things to be looking forward in the last days and to be warned of and to watch over. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.